ladies and gentlemen, Mark Schulman. Mark, welcome to the show. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. How are What's you? up, Ron? It's great to be here. And uh, speaker to speaker, human to human, spirit to spirit. Let's rock this. I got a funny story about drumming, Mark. I, a few years ago, was in a, mu a music shop with a bunch of mates, and I think we were pretty hungover. And I jumped on a set and I started sort of tapping away and I didn't have a musical bone in my body at that point. And a couple of them were like, hey man, you got some, some natural rhythm. And then the, the shop assistant came home. He's like, yeah, man, you're really good. Like 15 minutes later, I walk out of there with a $1,500 electric drum kit. Of course. And it turns out they were just <laughs> taking the piss out of me. Got some lessons and I think I lasted one lesson and then gave them to my brother-in-law for his wedding, wedding present. <laughs> Oh, well, but your brother-in-law's happy. He's stoked. He playing, yeah, is he yeah. playing at least? Yeah, no, he loves them. He's still using them. So it's, uh, it's the gift that keeps on giving. But awesome. how, did, how did you get into drums? Well, man, I am one of the luckiest people on the planet because drums chose me. I truly believe it. I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan when I was like three years old. And I saw John and George and Paul. And then I saw Ringo and something like resonated deep inside, you know, that big, beautiful nose and that smile and the, and the swishing hands. And then I saw the screaming girls. I'm like, that's it. And I asked my mom, mama, I got to play drums. She says, no, they're too loud. Can't you play a nice instrument? Your brother Randy plays violin. So I ended up going to a violin lesson with him and seeing what looked like a big violin of the corner turned out to be cello. I ended up playing cello for years. But then at five years old, my neighbors were rehearsing and there was a drum set. And I went, I sat behind the drum set and I could play. I wasn't a prodigy, but I just knew what to do. And at nine years old, my parents did not deny my passion any longer. They got me my first kit, had my first professional gig at 12. And I just knew, I, I come from a family of professors. So, you know, thinking about, and, and, and I'm, I, I, I'm supposed to have a, a reasonably high IQ. So my parents were like, are you gonna be a doctor, an attorney, a lawyer, you know? Uh, I had no intention. Drums really just grabbed me and I really was my, my only real, it was such a passion and I attached purpose to it. Then I got into recording and the hybrid of all of that understanding recording. And then I led my own band, understanding the concept of leadership and how to really create a band environment and, and then getting a demo deal with a record label. And then I went to two years of college and I didn't even get my bachelor's degree. I quit college to play music and now I do executive summits. <laughs> when I so uh, my parents were very proud when I got my first road gig because I actually started making some real money. They were like, okay, he's making money at least, you know. <laughs> but it was one of those things where, you know, very few people have something that they really know is th that that's their path. And my mother, literally up until my 40s, was still like, you should get a teaching credential so you have something to fall back on. <laughs> and my concept is, why would I want to fall backwards when I can lean forwards? Mm -hmm. Because if you have something to fall backwards on, 95% of the time, you do. But I just had that vision. And then it was up to me to take some sort of God-given talent and then work it and practice it and really learn and communicate. Fortunately, I also developed good communication skills that allowed me to understand that it's not just about the chops and the vocabulary when you're playing. It's about how you communicate to others. And, you know, I tell my students and people that I coach, you know, your, your net worth is your network is your net worth. And it really, it was about building the network and then it's all about relationships. I mean, I don't look at anybody as a customer or a client, I look at everybody as a relationship because every bit of success I have cultivated in my life is all, all every single, every, every single bit of success is based on rela a relationship or relationships that I established and cultivated. So I want to explore that a little bit more, Mark, because you've, you've played and toured with some extraordinary bands. We'll get, we'll get to those in a second, but what is it about, your ability to communicate that's been so instrumental in getting you to a point where people are like, yeah, we want Mark Shulman on board. Not only is he a kick-ass drummer, but he's actually, you know, great to work with, you know, he gets it. Like, where was that point for you? Well, you know, my, 
my boss Pink calls me Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. So I, I, from an early age, I think I understood that it was more about being an asset than being an ego. And I realized that somebody's got to listen because everybody else wants to talk. Mm -hmm. So if I could learn how to be a good listener, or at least pay attention to being a good listener and understanding that, and also understanding that as a drummer, we're kind of like the shepherds of the band. We're the foundation of the band. And I've kind of always looked when I've been on the road, like if everybody else is taken care of, I'm cool, man. I look at the drumming business, the speaking business, everything I do as a or as businesses of being of service. I am here to be of service. You know, I'm here to be of service to Pink. I'm here to be of service to the band members, to the audience, to the crew. And I'm fine when it comes to my family. Happy wife, happy life. When my daughter's happy, I learned, you know, in this marriage to Lisa that I'd much rather be happy than be right, you know? <laughs> so it's not about being cocky. It's not about, it's really about understanding the value of being of service to others. And when you really understand that, then you become a great band member, a great team member, a great listener, a great friend. Um, it took me about five years into our relationship because I'm a natural problem solver and coach. When I finally, my wife finally, like I, I finally understood that my wife does not want to be coached. She wants to be listened to. Mm -hmm. That's it. So everybody in the band wants to talk. You know, I, I heard something recently about Nel Nelson Mandela it was in an interview with I don't remember who he was interviewed with because I listen to a lot of different people, but apparently Nelson Mandela, when he was a kid, his father was a tribal leader. So when his father would lead these tribal summits, so to speak, his father would let everybody else speak first. His father wouldn't say a word until everybody else felt heard. And the challenge with so many leaders is they get up there and they set the agenda and they haven't listened yet. So if you're the one that listens, then you're the one that really has the empathy and the understanding and you understand the viewpoint of others. The viewpoint meaning where they're coming from, where you're coming from determines what you see. So if you take the time to understand others' viewpoints, then you can really be an asset. Because a lot of times we come in with our own agenda, right? Mm -hmm. We usually come in with some sort of agenda. Mm -hmm. If you listen, your agenda might really shift or you might really understand that you had the wrong agenda. And so there's a big value in that. Yeah, there's a, a guy, Michael Parkinson or Sir Michael Parkinson. You ever heard of him? Sir? He, Sir Michael Parkinson? Yes. So he's interviewed, I think, in excess of 2,500 of the most amazing people on the planet. Right. And he's uh he's still alive he's about 85 now he's actually going to come on the show later this year when he finishes his book but my father said to said to me he said michael parkinson i just find him so interesting and all he does is he asks a couple of open questions to the guests he barely does any talking and so that just just nails home that point like you don't have to be doing much talking to be found interesting <laughs> and i just and i just love that whole concept from him well and I totally agree. And that also, when you're interviewing somebody, it depends on where they go because people can drift. <laughs> so the main time to, to really start communicating and talking is to help bring them back to the point if you have a very specific thing you asked as an example. But if you're talking to somebody who's just absolutely brilliant, um, like an Elon Musk or a Malcolm Gladwell, you just let them talk, or a Gary V. Like I'm, I'm interviewing a lot of people for my book right now, and these amazing people, Grant Cardone, um, Tony Shea, uh, people like that, you just let them talk <laughs> because you know they're going to be giving all these wonderful insights and you don't want to get in the way. So let's talk about these books. You got two. So you've got one book at the moment, Conquering Life Stage Fright. Yes, that's it, been out since 2014, I think. And what's what's the story behind that one? Well, that's called Conquering Life Stage Fright: Three Steps to Top Performance. So it's really about the three steps to top performance. 
Conquering Life Stage Fright, it sort of lures you in. And it's a very interesting and intriguing um, title because I deal a lot with more with people's fears and transforming fear into confidence because the three the, 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 the three steps are what we call the three C's and they're derived from the co-writer of my next book and one of the great mentors of my life, Dr. Jim Samuels, brilliant thinker, created the three C's, clear, capable, confident. So I transferred them into clarity, capability, and confidence. So the book is based on stories from other people about how they have, I actually tell them, uh, explain what, what, what the three C's are, which essentially is you need a very, very clear vision about what it is you want to obtain, whatever that is, or, or the, the goal you want to achieve. And the more clear the vision, the more you're gonna understand exactly the uh, capability that you need to develop. And then you work, hopefully Gladwell's 10,000 hours, actually wasn't established by Gladwell, but he promoted the 10,000 hours of mastery. Yeah. So that you spend your time developing that capability and that's what leads to actual confidence as opposed to false confidence. And then I talk very specifically about certain fears, but one of the most wicked concepts that I can, that I can say that I learned from a specialist, from a, from a psychologist, is that the chemistry in the body for fear and excitement are literally identical. It's our perception of you know, the same feeling you get. It's, it's the sweaty palms. It's the, 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 palp, the, the, the heart that's beating really quickly. It's our perception and our projection of this chemistry that determines our experience. Tony Shea told me a great story relative to that as an example, because I interviewed Tony for my last book and for my, my upcoming book. And he said when he was a kid, he said he's never told anybody his story. When he was a kid, he was at his little local fairground and his friend wanted him to go on the zipper. Now the zipper is, I think every old fairground has one. It's that rectangular metal box. They strap you in with a chain and then they just whip you around as quickly as they can like they're trying to give you whiplash. Yeah. Tony, as a kid, was scared to death. He didn't want to go on it. His friend talked him into it. So he went on. Apparently, he was kind of stone-faced, wide-eyed. When they got off, his friend said, so Tony, what did you think? He said, I had this funny feeling in my crotch and in my belly. His friend said, great, that's excitement. You're supposed to have that feeling. And Tony's like, I remember, I'm supposed to have this feeling? Tony reframed the way that he looked at the experience. They went on the ride again. And ever since the end of the second ride experience, he's become a freak, an addict for the scariest roller coasters he can find. Because he reframed it from fear into excitement. So even dealing with COVID and so much of what's going on, you know, it really is about managing change. And there's two things we do with change. We either embrace it or resist it. What we resist persists. The more you resist something, the more anxiety creates, the more fear it creates. So when you embrace something, then you can actually shift it into a realm of excitement. And you can find something about that that can be exciting. I mean, I'm not talking about like when someone's holding a gun to your head, you should be afraid. But most of the things we're actually afraid of are, are made up in our minds and we can shift that fear to excitement and get a rush, get adrenaline, get dopamine and serotonin going through the brain and shift our experience. And that gives us enormous power. So that's kind of some of the concept that the first book is based on, um, how to shift that fear eventually into creating real confidence. And the second book, which is what I speak about now, is The Power of Attitude. Now, Dr. Jim and I are writing this together because it's based on the most brilliant formula I've ever heard in my life, and I use, utilize it every single day. What is e, it? What is it? E times B equals C. It begins with attitude. Now, here's what is so special about attitude. And a lot of people think attitude, attitude, schmattitude. I've heard that attitude my whole damn life. Attitude has enormous power because we know we cannot control what happens to us as evidenced by this freaking global pandemic. But no matter what is happening to you at any moment in time, you always have the power to change, shift, or control your attitude about what is happening to you. Think about that for a minute. Because your attitude is like your point of view. 
where you're looking from determines what you see. I call it your, um, we'll call it your, uh, we'll just call it your point of view. And what's really fascinating about this is where we're looking from and our attitude, it's so much of what we see is hinged on the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves mm -hmm. and about these situations. It's the filters through which or the lens through which we are looking because what you're look it's not what you're looking at, it's what you see or perceive that really matters. And what is the story? What is the meaning that you are attaching to it? And when did you tell yourself this story? When you were five years old? Because so much of our decisions are based on stories on our developmental years that were set in by the time we were five years old. I mean, if your story is a comedy, you're in good shape. But if your story is a melodrama or a murder mystery, oh my gosh. But <laughs> attitude is the, is the basis of this phenomenal formula because your attitude is what drives your behavior. And think about that. So by having the understanding that you have the power to shift that attitude in a moment's notice, you can drive more desirable behavior. And your behavior is what determines the consequences of your life. And one attitude can drive many behaviors and one behavior can drive many consequences. So by understanding that you have the power to control or shift your attitude, you can drive the most desirable consequences you never even dreamed possible. And I employ this in my life every single day. And the difference between this philosophy and similar philosophies is so many philosophies focus on your behavior or they go right to the output of the consequence. It all begins with your attitude and not just a positive attitude, but very specifically, what is the attitude that you want to generate and the attitude you want to shift? I mean, I might shift my attitude a hundred times in a day to generate the behavior that I know I need to generate to produce the consequences that I want to produce. And that's what I attribute my success to. It all begins with attitude. So everything I've talked about so far, you can relate back to attitude. It's so simple. It's, but we actually go into great detail about how you can create attitude shifts and very specific attitudes and what specific attitudes will produce. Jim has what he calls the MO scale. And there are six positive attitudes and six negative attitudes. And you can tell if you get into a specific attitude, you can almost bet your life it's going to produce a specific behavior and a specific outcome. And the more you, the more you understand how you can grow with this MO scale up the positive side of the attitude, the more extraordinary outcomes you can create. Wow. And that's Look why I'm here being interviewed by you because I've been, be able to cr I've been able to create extraordinary consequences and outcomes in my life based on conscious and committed attitude shifts and choices that I've made. Oh, I love that, Mark. And I'm, when, when's the book coming out? When can we get it? That's a darn good question because we just talked to our, my book agent today. <laughs> and we have been in the process of doing all the interviews, so we don't actually have a proper book proposal in, you know, set up. Dr. Jim has so much tech and so much information. We have enough information for six books. Yeah, and we're, yeah. We're through the book proposal, and I want to get a few more interviews that I of people that I have in mind. Maybe you can help me with that. You can help me interview um, some people that you recommend as well. I'm always looking for really high profile people that will embrace people that would look at this formula and understand, wow, that's a very powerful formula, and then can explain it. I and mean, I've interviewed, you know, world-class athletes and uh, neuropsychologists and, and all, all kinds of CEOs and musicians. I'm looking for a cross-section of different people that can embrace this and can talk not only about how positive attitude shifts have, have eventually created these outcomes, but how negative attitude choices have created negative consequences too, because it's important to understand how all that works. Oh, I got some phone numbers that I can send you after this, Mark. Don't you worry about that. Excellent, brother. We had uh, one particular guy, Sir Steve Hansen, who's the uh, All Black, former All Black coach, most successful All Black coach in the history of the game. 
and almost, yeah so you know there's a quite a few of those people but we'll, we'll talk about that offline if you like and i love stories you know everybody's got to have that good story man because we learn from stories well this is this is the the kind of guest that we we're trying to get on the show people that are really that love telling a, a really great story that we can transport us there and, I, and that was one yeah. of the things that intrigued me about you mark you know because you come from this this amazing uh, musical background and but you've you know, there's not too many people that I've seen in the, in the game that have transitioned to becoming professional speakers as well. Um, maybe I just haven't seen them, but uh, I love it because you get a, a really amazing insight into your life of some of which I really wanted to, to explore. Now, can you just please go through and some of the, the bands that you've worked with over the, the course of your amazing career? <laughs> this is well, Cool. One of the impetus for writing the original book was the, my, my first horrible failure uh, of an audition with that band Bad English, which was a hybrid of the guys from Journey and John Waite. And that was a great impetus of failure for me. Like if you're going to fail, fail really big. All the great people that I listen to and all the great philosophers say, man, the more you fail, the closer you get to success. So if you're going to fail, make it really big and learn from that failure. What do you learn? You know, with, with Thomas Edison, the light bulb, a thousand failures until he had one that worked. You know, you just feel really big. Elon Musk said the same thing. He failed so many damn times, you know. <laughs> so, uh, I, then I, I, I learned a lot from that. I, I, I failed because I was rushing really horribly. So I needed to develop my internal sense of time. And I was so freaked out with fear. So I vowed to myself with that failure that I would do what I could do to create the greatest, you know, confidence in my sense of time and also great confidence in my ability to communicate and transcend fear into confidence. So that became, became my journey. And right around that time is when I met uh, Dr. Jim and I, like you, I, I quit drinking, I quit doing drugs, I quit everything. I just got really, really serious. So uh, then I got my first road gig with Brenda Russell, R&B artist, opening up for Billy Idol. From there, I played with Jeff Lorber Fusion and Dave Cause. Through that, I ended up getting my first big rock tour playing with Richard Marks. 15 months touring the world, playing like, you know, 90% screaming girls. Yeah, 16 years old. Right on. <laughs> and then I played with Bobby Caldwell, this amazing R&B artist. And then I auditioned for Foreigner and started working with Foreigner off and on for 27 years. And then uh, wow. through Foreigner, I met this amazing producer, Keith Forsey. And Keith was the guy that uh, worked with Simple Minds and Billy Idol. So I ended up working with Simple Minds and Billy Idol. Went back with Foreigner, worked with this amazing Japanese artist, worked with Udo Lindenberg, the greatest German artist, still a friend of mine. And in the midst of this, I auditioned for Cher three times, and I finally got the gig in 1999. Probably in the Guinness Book of World Records, the guy has auditioned for Cher more than anybody. And I stayed <laughs> with Cher, and then Cher's manager. Uh, then I, uh, oh, in and around that, who else did I play with? Then I subbed for Matt Sorum with playing with Velvet Revolver for a while. Um, who else did I tour with in and around that time? Oh, then I got this, then I left Billy Idol because Billy's kind of slowed it. I was with Billy on and off for eight years. And then I got the chance to go on tour with Stevie Nicks and Cheryl Crow. That's when I left the Billy Idol band. Then I went back to Cher. Then I played with Velvet Revolver. And then Cher's manager started managing Pink. And then Pink's drummer couldn't do a gig because he double booked himself, the poor son of a bitch. And I came in and did two weeks of clubs with Pink. At the end of the two weeks, they hired me. Then I did her first big tour in 2006, been with Pink ever since. And I wow. still play with Cher in and around that because it was like playing with both artists because they were both managed by the same uh, manager. And I uh, still play with Pink, come to think of it. And I got my own studio and I do a lot of sessions and a lot of production. And uh, I'm a very fortunate and very grateful man. I do not take this for granted. I, the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I say 24 brand new hours and I smile. Because I've learned that literally smiling can change your physiology. When you smile, it activates hundreds of muscles in your face that literally 
trigger your body and your mind to relax and release endorphins in your brain. And then I think immediately of at least three people and three things for which I'm grateful. I just read this study where they had somebody focusing on uh, a number of people focusing on gratitude and they put them and they gave them MRIs. And they determined that when you are really what I, what I call the attitude of gratitude, because that's one of the attitudes that I conjure up and talk about, that gratitude was producing endorphins in the brain similar to a low level antidepressant. That's how powerful gratitude is. So I am a man who constantly embraces gratitude because it literally is like a drug. And my buddy, Tim Sanders, who was the chief solutions officer for Yahoo and uh, two, be two best-selling books, he told me, he said in his Southern accent, my grandma Billy told me that gratitude is like a muscle that needs to be exercised because gratitude can create enormous power. Um, but it's easy to celebrate gratitude when things are going well, but it's even more powerful to employ the attitude of gratitude in challenging times because I was told by a leading psychiatrist, and it's so obvious, but it's so amazing that we cannot have a positive and negative conscious thought at the same time, right? So wow. if you are in the opposite attitude of gratitude, which is the, the like the attitude of scarcity, we'll call it. Fear and scarcity, on yeah. The, on the fear, on the anxiety, on the blocks, on the barriers, and you are committed and aware enough to stop and create a conscious attitude shift, ABC, A times B equals C, to gratitude. You start with one small thing that you appreciate about yourself, about somebody else, and you just keep on going and keep on going and keep on going. Before you know it, you are literally putting yourself into a completely different state, a state of gratitude. And that state of scarcity, you just left it behind. It's gone. COVID-19 has been the greatest thing to ever happen to me. And I don't wish any of the ill will or, you know, the, the, whatever on anyone else. I've, I've released 24 podcasts. I've written a book. And, and I, my job was made redundant at, uh, in March. And sure, there could be some other areas of my life that could do some improvement. But I will look back at this period of my life as such a wonderful gift and opportunity because I've chosen to look at it that way. Absolutely. And, that, and that's been the key. And I, I'm, I'm keen to explore, because you said you gave up the drinking and the Congratulations, party. by the way. That's, that's absolutely wonderful. Thank you so fun. much. Yeah, well, the, the book was inspired by a guest that I had on, Les Brown, the motivational speaker. Oh, you know, Les, Les great he's like so motivating it's it's just insane so if you want if you i'll, I'll introduce you to him because yeah i i want to i want to interview less yeah That's so great for the for my book he'd love you too he'd love you too but i, yeah. I want to explore this 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 drinking and stuff so have you have you totally knocked all that stuff on the head and how long for uh, i didn't drink a sip of alcohol for 17 years now I do drink, I enjoy my tequila, but not in excess. Clearly uh, you got to- I started drinking when I uh, went through my, uh, my, my divorce, started dating. Um, and uh, I enjoy it, but it's just not something to do in excess. Beautiful. So I want to explore this a little bit more. So what, how, given the industry that you're in, have you been, so, been able to be so strong and just saying no when you are constantly probably bombarded by offers to party and whatever else? Well, it becomes a way of life. Everything we do is literally a habit, right? If you think of everything as being a habit, you're just shifting and developing new habits. So when I get got into the habit of being sober, then it's just, then I'm not considering. I don't, I don't walk into a bar and think about drinking. I walk into a bar just to hang out and chat and talk. When I order, when I when I when I was, you know, abstaining from from drinking, I would just order club soda with lime. Love club soda with lime. So it became a habit. So I don't always drink. I don't always order a drink when I go into a bar now. Yeah. But as I said, I become a bit of a tequila appreciator. I won't say connoisseur. I'm not that good. Um, <laughs> But it, it's more like creating habits, like creating rituals. 
like my morning ritual of smiling and then focusing on gratitude and then meditating and then doing certain stretches and certain exercises, they be, it becomes ritualistic. It becomes like a habit. And the more you do it, the more just be, the more it is you and it is just simply what you do. It seems so simple, doesn't it? Um, but it, it does take work. It takes practice. Oh, and heck yeah. It takes a lot of practice, but anything, look, my um, decision to really drive my speaking business to a level that I'm at right now required an enormous amount of work. I mean, I, grew, I, was, I, was, I did a thousand drum clinics. Drum clinics are like when you get in front of a bunch of drummers and you play and you tell stories. My speeches, my speaking career is an evolution of that. The only difference is I studied with two speaking coaches, studied an enormous amount of philosophy, studied with an acting coach, a director, and a storyteller. Stood in the mirror, recorded myself a gazillion times, developed all these relationships by cold calling every agent I could. Everything requires work, or I, let's say it requires time, because you can look at it like work, or you can look at it like play or enjoying. And the, and the, and the comparison I always use is, I don't work drums, I play drums. So I look at my speeches the same way. They may require an enormous amount of time and effort and energy to organize. That doesn't mean that I need to view them as an attitude of work. I can view them as an attitude of service, as an attitude of play, as an attitude of building my own energy because I, it lifts my energy. I, when I speak, it's like something comes through me and I'm like Mark times 10. <laughs> because I allow it and I get off on it and I have so much fun because I know that I, the more fun that I'm having, first of all, there've been many studies that show the more fun you're having, the higher level in which you perform. So if you're having more fun, you are performing at a higher level. That's just the way that the physiology and the endorphins in your brain work. So the more fun I have, as opposed to getting hung up on, even if I make a mistake and I made plenty of mistakes in my life on stage, playing drums, speaking, but you know, you're gonna focus on the mistakes or focus on moving forward. Yeah. I never focus on the mistake. I just like kind of gain, gain my composure, take a sip of water and keep going. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. And I hear you, I hear you. I'd love to hear your favorite story of when you were touring, when you're playing, when you're playing drums with whoever, whenever. Wow, my favorite story. Oh my gosh, there's some amazing stories. Um, my story with getting the Richard Marx gig was kind of a fun story. It was more about the getting of the gig than the, than the, the playing itself. I mean, I can tell you a frightening story about how Pink almost died one night doing one of the aerial stunts. Um, because her attitude was just profound. I'll, I'll tell you that story in a because that's a, that's, a, that's a current story and that's, that's one that uh, has to do oh. with current artists. But uh, we were doing our first European stadium tour, right? And uh, we were playing in Germany one night, like the loudest crowd ever, 50,000 people, they were so loud. And, and Pink just, we, what the ritual was is, is we always ended the tour and, and then, excuse me, ended each show playing that song, So What? And she would do this incredible aerial stunt, this outrageous aerial stunt we call the 360, where she'd come running out from behind the stage. She'd run down the runway to the front of the satellite stage wearing a little harness, right? And attached to each harness were two carabiner clips. Two dancers would clip her in with two carabiner clips. Attached to each clip were two high tension cables that stretched across the entire audience. When she'd give the signal to the computer operator, he'd lift her up, and then she'd soar across the audience, you know, speeds of up to like 35 miles an hour. What is that? Like uh, 55 kilometers. 55, yeah. <laughs> drops of up to like 30 feet, what, 10 meters. And she'd even circle around to the back of the audience. So even the people in the cheap seats could see the sweat on her brow. Wow. And one night we were in Germany and this was a crazy night. So she was especially hyped. She went running down there. They clipped her in with the carabiner clips. She immediately lifted her arm, but what she didn't realize is one of the carabiner clips was turned upside down. And 
The dancer couldn't warn her. And the two seconds it took the dude who was operating the computer to realize, instead of getting lifted up over the audience, she got brutally and rapidly dragged by one side across the satellite stage over hot lighting cans. She got pulled six feet, two meters into what we call the pit and up against the metal side railing where I couldn't see her. And dude, I swear, I, I, I felt like, like I was having an anxiety attack. It was one of the most frightening moments of my life. I think I stopped breathing and I couldn't see her. And that audience at that point was dead silent. And the band was dead silent and she was dead silent. Man, I, I literally thought she was dead. I started to like tear up. And then I heard the sweetest sound. It was the sound of pink cussing. <laughs> she was cussing. She was breathing. She was alive. She was angry. This was a great sign. But what happened next was crazy because her husband, Carrie, had seen what had happened. He ran down into the pit. She had Carrie lift her back onto the stage. The girls had battered and bruised and broken. He got on the stage with her. She couldn't even stand up. It looked like she'd broken her leg because her leg was up. She's like leaning on his shoulder. And then she very feebly says to the audience, everybody, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I think I'm too injured to perform the last song, but, but I, I, I feel so bad, I gotta make it up to you. I'm willing to give everybody their money back with one, one song left. By that <laughs> point, they had brought a stretcher onto the stage. They hauled her off on the stretcher. That audience was roaring louder than before. I looked in the eyes of the audience. Half the people had tears in their eyes. I put, Put, put tears in my eyes, a very emotional moment. It's the moment we thought we lost pink. It was also the moment that I realized, wow, we know we cannot control what happens to us, but it is the grace with which we recover, so to speak, from disruption, from challenges, from life-threatening situations, and our unyielding desire to provide rock star service to our audience, our customers, our clients. That's what determines the future of our relationship with our customers, our clients, the future of our business. And then, and you know, any more mortal like me probably would have been laid up in the hospital for about a month. Fortunately, we had the next day off. Homegirl didn't even break any bones. She barely broke any skin. There's speculation from management as, as to whether we'd ever even do it. Because the manager was like, it's just too damn high risk. Not to mention the insurance premium skyrocketed. But the following day, talk about shifting fear into excitement. Pink not only didn't have any iota of any like slight thought of canceling this 360, she got up during sound check, did the rig check herself. And the next night we were not only playing So What and still doing the 360, but to this day it remains the show closer of the show. And anybody I've ever asked thinks it's the coolest show closer in the history of pop music. But I've thought to myself many times, what if she never crawled back on that stage? What if she never got back up and did the 360? Her career trajectory would have been completely different. Her brand would have been completely different. The perception of who she is, her success would have been completely different. But that's based on how extraordinary she is and how committed she is. Anybody that's ever seen her live would know there is not a more committed artist. I mean, she lies down on the stage to sign autographs and to sign body parts because she has like thousands of people that have tattooed her signature into their arms because she signs their arms. But who else does that? And she reads every sign and acknowledges people and says, hi. I mean, I don't know any artist that has that level of commitment. So I learned a lot by studying her. A lot of what I've been able to garner and create and then manifest in my speeches and in my books is from studying the greatness of people like that. Because there's no accident to success. I mean, she is, a, she's an absolute icon. And as a matter of fact, we did this record breaking stadium tour in Europe, 30 to 100,000 people each night in the month of July last year. She's the highest grossing artist in the history of pop music in one month. She outgrows Springsteen. She outgrows U2. She outgrows Ed Sheeran, who's like one dude with no dancers, low production costs. <laughs> I mean, think about that. In Australia, we played the Rod Laver Arena 
19 shows in a row. Not in a row, but 19 shows in one tour. Yeah, 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 I remember. They gave her enough. They gave her a room, they gave her a pole, they gave her a bathroom. They named every part of that building after her that they could possibly name. It's extraordinary. What an, I mean, what an example for all of us. So I love studying great people. I can't learn enough. That's why when he said Les Brown, it's like, oh, of course I've studied Les Brown. He's brilliant. I listen to Tom Billy you and Impact Theory. You hit the Impact Theory on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Like I've listened to like 25 interviews or more of just the greatest people, the greatest thinkers. I read whatever I can because I think the interesting thing to me is the more I know, the more I realize I don't know. <laughs> so the more I learn, <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> you know, and I'm totally humble. I just look at myself as a conduit. I'm completely egoless about what I do. For me, I'm just like fortunate enough to be able to communicate, to have a brain that understands how to synthesize different philosophies into a presentable format. And I do the work. And I love the work I do. And even when I don't love it, I find a way to love it. Or I take a break and do something I love and come back to it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Shulman. <laughs>